A very good afternoon to you and welcome to Ibro Up to Date at 1. It is the 13th of July 2019 where we have a lot in store for you. We do start this coverage at the betting industry where the multi-billion shilling betting industry has been thrown into a limbo after mobile operators closed down mobile money and SMS short codes run by the firms. Safaricom suspension of M-Pesa pay bill numbers and SMS short codes for some 27 betting firms among them Spot Pesa and Betin. The move sparked anxiety in the 200 billion industry, which has been in a push and pull with the state. Spot Pesa, one of the leading betting companies, have lashed out at the government, saying that they are tax compliant and will soon challenge the matter in court. First, I wanted to assure everybody that Spot Pesa, uh, we are completely tax compliant in terms of taxes and all regulations. And uh, to reassure the public that we're doing everything in our power to resolve all the issues with all key stakeholders, including the Kenya Revenue Authority and the Ministry of Interior. I believe this is due to a misunderstanding, and I also believe that all issues can be resolved through dialogue, and we are currently engaging all key stakeholders in government to ensure that everything is back to normal. At the same time, because we have a wide fa family of employees at Spot Pesa, approximately 400 currently, and the wider family, which of course in includes our sports fraternity members like Gormai, AFC and AFC Leopards. It is, I feel it is my responsibility to protect them and that is why we're using everything in our power, in, including even uh, legal means to ensure that we protect the business. In the meantime, uh, we will ensure that we keep engaged with the authority to ensure that businesses are resolved as soon as possible. Now let's turn our head to a rather tragic story where at least 12 people, including prominent Canadian Somali journalists, have been killed in an attack on a hotel in southern Somalia. Security officials said a suicide bomber rammed a car containing explosive into the hotel in the port of Kismayu, after which gunmen then stormed the building. Three Kenyans are reported to be among the 12 people who have been killed. Authorities said a suicide bomber rammed a vehicle loaded with explosives into the popular Medina Hotel in the southern port town of Kismayo before several heavily armed gunmen forced their way inside, shooting as they left. Mohamed Omar Sahal, an SBC TV correspondent based in Kismayo, and Hodan Naleye, a female TV journalist with her husband, are among those who were killed. You are watching Integration TV on YouTube the very first English television show for Somalis around the world, where we connect and inspire everyday Somalis to come together and share their narratives. I hope that you... The inspirational TV personality, Hodan Nalaya, who returned from Canada to report positive stories about Somalia, was the founder of Integration TV that reports on local and diaspora. Nalaya founded the media platform to tell stories about life in Somalia and the Somali diaspora. Recent episodes had focused on Somalia's female entrepreneurs and things to do in the city of Las Anod. She moved to Canada with her family when she was six years old and went on to become a figurehead of the Somali community in Canada. But the mother of two had recently returned to Somalia. The deaths of Nalaya and Sahal become the first journalists killed in the country this year, according to a statement by Somalia Journalist Syndicate. The Somali Journalists' Union confirmed the deaths of the two reporters. Al-Shabaab has since claimed responsibility. According to several sources, most of those staying in the hotel were politicians and traders ahead of upcoming regional elections. Now let's head over to the corridors of justice where the four suspects linked to the murder of two girls aged between four and eight years at Ombondo village in Kenyanya sub-county in Kisi County were arraigned in court but not charged. David Omwenga, Timothy Aroni, Gilbert Nyabuto and Evans Nyabuto were arrested on Wednesday following the incident. The chief prosecutor assigned to the case told Ogembo Law Court that the police had recovered some vital evidence from this suspect. This includes 23,020 shillings alleged to have been stolen from the guardian of the deceased. Kisi resident magistrate Gloria Baraza granted the prosecution permission to detain the suspect for 14 more days in order to complete investigations.
Now elsewhere, four male students at Malatani Mixed Secondary School were arrested Friday night in connection with an arson incident at the institution. The four spent the night at Katangi Police Station for allegedly torching the school dormitory that hosts male students. Yata Education Director Stephen Kitungu said the dormitory was set on fire while students were on their evening studies. He added that no student was injured, adding that investigations into the incident have commenced. The four will be held in police cells until Monday when they will be arraigned in court. Now to a little bit of politics, Kapsaret Member of Parliament Oscar Sudi has castigated Interior Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi and PS Karanja Kibicho for forgetting their roles and engaging early 2022 succession politics. Speaking during a peace meeting at El Geo Marakwet, Sudi raised concerns over the high level of insecurity in the North Rift region and especially along the West Pokot and El Geo Marakwet border. Our reporter Njeri Njugu tells us more. <laughs> Capsulate MP Oscar Sudi has urged PS Karanja Kibicho and Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi to stop politicking and ensure the lives of Kenyans are protected, adding that for months he has been looking for the deal in the interior docket, but all in vain. For the last uh, three, four months, minute after PS Kibicho, Kwamunda Mrevza, and Mulize, Mambo Haya, Yahu Salama, Katika, Leo La Pokot, Navarakwet. According to the MP, leaders should not force the residents to maintain harmony. Instead, they should tell them more of the benefits of ensuring peace in the region. Sigur MP Peter Lochakapong called on the security officers in the county to cooperate with leaders in tackling insecurity in the area. So to mesema, sisi kama viongozi ambao tumechaguliwa na wananchi hapa, upande wa Marakwet na upande wa Pokot, sisi tuongoze hii mambo ya amani. Na mimi najua itakuja. He also noted that development was only possible with peace in the region. Tunataka watu kuna maendeleo mabarabara mashule ifunguliwe na tumesema i think it's enough it's enough sisi tumekubali kwamba lazima tutembee barabara ya amani njeri njogo for every tv now elsewhere, Chief Justice David Maraga has called upon judges and magistrates to clear cases that have taken long in the courts. This comes after Maraga assured Kenyans that 4000 appellate court cases will be cleared by the end of this year. <laughs> Speaking in Vihiga while opening the Vihiga Law Courts, Justice Maraga said such delayed cases have scared away investors who intend to develop Kenya. The CJ further added that the judiciary has constructed 56 courts across the country. <laughs> Kama hapa vile tumekubaliana na wa, tunakubaliana kufika mwisho wa maka huu, sitaki kuona kesi ambao hiko saidi ya miaka mine. Vihiga Deputy Governor Dr. Patrick Saisi urged members of National Assembly to consider allocating judiciary more funds. To expand its services to its people. And we don't give them enough money to do that. We are lying to ourselves. Dr. Saisi appealed to the judiciary to consider waiving filing fees for cases filed against county governments, saying counties spend huge sum of monies for those cases, hence affecting development at grassroots levels. Because we spend a lot of money paying when we are responding to cases, money that would have gone to pay school fees for our children. However, Sabata legislator Alfred Agoy said the judiciary should up the game in fight against corruption. It is my pleasure to welcome. This comes even as the judiciary announced on February this year the rollout of an ambitious case management scheme that will see corruption related matters concluded within five months at most. But we know corruption is fighting back. 
the only weapon that he needs is your support. If and when those files come to you, please put them to jail. On April, Justice Maraga tasked Court of Appeal President William Ouko to expedite the process of reducing backlog of cases that were more than five years old that accumulates to 87%. Maraga promised to clear the remaining 13% by the end of the year. Now let's go back to the corridors of justice where the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission intends to appeal a court decision that blocked orders to investigate the accounts of top Nakuru lawyer Professor Tom Ojenda. This comes after the Court of Appeal ruled that the move infringed on Ojenda's fundamental rights and affected his interest as no notice was issued to him. The three judges, Roslyn Nyambuye, Paul Kiyagi, and Sankel Olikantai, ruled that EACC chose the easy path of seeking warrants instead of furnishing the embattled lawyer with necessary information before preferring charges against him and take preliminary steps required under the Constitution. However, it was EACC argument that under Section 26 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crime Revision requires that a notice be issued only to an unassociate and not a suspect. On March 18, 2015, the Chief Magistrate at Kibra Law Court directed the EACC probe Professor Tom Ojenda over the account at the Standard Chartered Bank, Nakuru branch linked to his law firms. The application alleged that $280 million was paid into Ojenda's advocate client account by Mumia Sugar Company Limited for legal services he allegedly had not rendered. Ojenda then filed a petition under the certificate of urgency complaining that EACC secretly obtained warrants to investigate his bank account. The application further claimed that issuance of the warrants was necessary to assist investigation into the fictions payment which were at that time considered to be criminal. Further, the anti-graft agency said investigations revealed that Mumia Sugar Company made various suspicion payments amounting to 280 million shillings to a gender standard chartered bank account. Former Nairobi Governor Dr. Evans Kidero, who was by then the managing director of the company, allegedly sanctioned the irregular payments to be made prior to his exit from the company. Njerin Jogu for Able TV. And in other news, as many in Kenya and the entire world view disabled animals as superstitious beings, one nature conservancy in Transoya County serves as a home of these animals founded by one Ndura Koimburi who has a passion and love for such animals. The conservancy has been at the forefront to discourage people against discriminating such animals. Milia Kisenya now reports. This is a home for approximately 30 disabled animals. Kitale National Conservancy, also known as Ndura Park, was founded to give a different picture of animals with disability who have over the years been viewed as superstitious animals. In a bit to understand as to why Ndura Koimburi, the founder of the park, was moved to start this beautiful home for these animals, in 2016, he takes us through the millions of superstitions carried around by the many people about these animals, forgetting that they have a place in the society. So I decided to tell people that there is nothing uh, wrong with the keeping of these animals, that they should be viewed positively, the way we look, and it's just some occurrence in nature. The park has so far served as a local tourist attraction, including schools. The C students learn the theory behind the well-being of these animals, especially understanding the consequences of genetic mutation. One among the many reasons Koimburi prides in having started the park. Don't regret keeping these animals because like when you came today, you have seen so many students. Some of them come to learn about the genetic mutation, a topic which is taught in our secondary schools. Koimburi notes of one experience of an individual who had an instance where his cow was born with six legs with the community viewing him as to be involved with witchcraft. The owner did not want the evening to come. He wanted me to go right in the morning and he kept on calling me the whole day whether I was going to, key, uh, to, to take the animal because he was very embarrassed and people were saying all sorts of things. Upon being asked if he had any challenges raising these animals, Quimburi notes that 
With their delicate nature, there are a number, and with that, a veterinary officer is of need. Has its challenges. Like I have to have a veterinary officer uh, on the base right here, and he has to come as regularly as I call him, and I keep on calling them from time to time. Like humans, animals are prone to birth defects and devastating accidents that leave them disabled. What's incredible about all creatures, including mankind, is their ability to thrive despite their challenges and surviving against all odds, as in one way or the other, they do have a right. Milia Kisenya for Abro TV. Now from that story, let's take a look at what is threatening the wildlife. Conservationists have raised a red flag on increased discharge of tons of single-use plastic containers into Lake Nakuru that is now threatening its ecosystem. Lake Nakuru National Park Senior Warden Catherine Wambani says at least 30 to 40 tons of single-use plastic bottles find their way into Lake Nakuru National Park every rainy season, posing danger to wildlife. Every week, over 500 kilograms of plastic bottles are collected from the park, which increases during heavy rains. To Naimiza County Government, eh? to wake up, ikabiliane na, na uharibifu wa lekinakuru. Hizi machupa kusema kweli, kama tuli, tulikabiliana na eh, eh, plastic, plastic carrier bags, hata hizi chupa, maoni yangu mimi, the executive director to Multi-Touch International, an environmental conservation non-governmental organization involved in the rehabilitation and cleanup of the river Christine Wangari said, last month alone 28 tons of single-use plastic bottles were retrieved from a screen constructed at a point where the river flows into the lake. This becomes an unpleasant place. She says she is engaging a section of members of parliament to draft legislation to ban the single use of single use bottles, plastic straws, cutlery and calves that are choking waterways in the country. Much as the animals may not consume are the plastics, we have seen animals that have been entangled by plastics and therefore restricted in their growth, in nature, in their lives. And of course, a sight of an animal in a plastic is not what you would want to encounter when you are on a game drive in a national park. Ms. Wangari says the ultimate source of the problem, Kenyans' new fund dependence on throwaway plastic products, should be tackled through a total ban on single-use plastic containers. Two years ago, Kenya banned the use, manufacture, and sale of environmentally harmful plastics, polythene bags, and packaging materials. The ban was challenged, but the court upheld it. Fatuma Hassan for Ibru TV. Thank you, Fatma, for that story. Now let's head over to the international front, where Zimbabwe is experiencing its worst power shortage in years, forcing many workers onto the night shift, the only time when elect electricity rather is reliable. As Columbus Mavunga reports from Harare, the government blames the shortage on businesses and industries for not paying their power bills. Like most parts of the country, Harare gets power for just seven hours per day, and it comes during the night. Workers like welder Nelson Mujuen have been forced to switch to the night shift. But they need more power availability to be able to handle all of their workload. If the government can give us Alexis during the day, I think we can be able to meet our targets. Because actually we are actually getting some orders from clients and we won't be able to meet our targets. Zimbabwe's power shortage is the worst in at least three years, and the analysts say it is costing millions of dollars a day in lost productivity. While generators are common, Zimbabwe's ongoing fuel shortage makes running them all day too expensive for many. Uh, actually, we have decided to, to some generators sometimes during the day. But won't be actually most of the generators we only they, we can only work for four hours then we cut them off. But because if you constantly use them, by the end of the day we won't be able to have that same generator again because actually they have a time frame. 
for working. So we end up, we end up coming in the evening again and working in the night. Zimbabwe is negotiating with Mozambique and South Africa to provide more power exports. Harare hopes the talks will be a fruit after it paid South Africa $10 million in June for power export debt. Authorities blame the power shortage on $100 million owed to Zimbabwe's Electricity Supply Authority, or ZESAM. We all need to pay our debts to assure ourselves of power. I also want to make a, a specific um, a public appeal to commerce and industry. They also owe significant amounts of money and uh, we would, without power, they can't operate. And when they don't operate, life becomes very difficult for, for all of us. You say that uh, you are affected even though you are paying. We need that to stop. For ordinary workers like Mujuem, less power means less income and having to work during the cold nights. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Harare. Diving into the world of sport where Bandari FC were on Friday night knocked out of the Sekafa Kagami Cup after playing out to a goalless draw against Tanzania's Azam FC, thereby falling short of points that would have otherwise lifted them to the next stage of the competition. The Dockers were held back after registering draws in all their Group B matches against Tanzania's Azam FC. Uganda's KCCA and host Mukura victory, the result left Bandari with only three points from as many matches and without a chance of progressing to the quarterfinals. Now to the tennis court where tennis ace Roger Federer Friday night displayed a remarkable performance at the center court beating Rafael Nadal 7-6, 7-3, 1-6, 6-3, 6-4 to qualify for the 2019 Wimbledon final. The anticipated match was the 40th career meeting between the Golden Duo with 38 Grand Slam titles between them. Federer is now set to play against Serbian top seed Novak Djokovic in the finals on Sunday and he will become the tournament's oldest finalist since Ken Roswell in 1974. Federer is targeting to extend his record of clinching the Wimbledon title to nine. Defending champion Djokovic, on the other hand, is targeting his 16th Grand Slam triumph after beating Spain's 23rd seed Roberto Bautista Agut in the four sets earlier on Friday. Now to the Tour de France, uh, Dylan claimed first his first stage win of his year's Tour de France as Guillo retained the leader's yellow jersey after stage seven of the race. Caleb Ewan crossed the finish line, second head of Peter Sagan as defending champion Grant Thomas finished safely in the peloton to remain fifth overall. At 230 kilometer, stage seven was the longest of this year's tour. The race shall later this afternoon head back to the hills with a bumpy 200 kilometers route from Macon to the St. Etienne that features almost 3,800 meters of climbing. Well, that brings us to the end of this bulletin, but do join us in our subsequent bulletins. Of course, Gumzo Weekendi with Milia Kisenya, my colleague, will be uh, in the studios by 7, 7 p.m. My name is Abdiaziz Ashim. Good afternoon. <laughs>